All right. Well, like I said, this is a much smaller group than this morning. Um, so I'm going to share a, a slideshow and try to um, run through this. Um, Jonathan has already heard me speak once today, but um, basically I want to divide this presentation into two parts. Um, so a little bit more about me. I've been in the nonprofit leadership field for a little more than 15 years and I've been doing fundraising for about 20. Um, it's always a changing game and you know when I was working with Faye and Christina primarily the fundraisers at the ERC um, we were talking about just the challenge of trying to do a such a large you know kind of presentation like this um, because all of our countries are going to be different our constituents are going to be different our needs are different um, and just even the legal structures of how we're all incorporated are going to be different. However, what I hope to give you today is the start um, of a conversation. I hope to you know, provide a lot of questions uh, that get you thinking and start really you know, diving into what does it mean to really have a well-run organization. Um, I know in, in the ERC world, we call everything camps. I, I have done consulting before for nonprofit organizations. Um, and so I'm going to oftentimes refer to organizations or nonprofits. Um, but that could mean anything from camps to like in the US LLCs, it could mean any sort of incorporation based on where you are. Um, because these things are fairly universal. Um, at least the stuff that we're covering today. And hopefully after this conversation, um, like Aaron said, we can pair different camps up and I know Faye, Christina and myself are going to be looking at the spreadsheet that Aaron has shared that we um, want you all to fill out so that we can figure out the best way to support each of the different groups of camps and the challenges you're facing. So this is just a start. It's meant to provide a very top level overview of organizational uh, capacity building. Um, and in brief, organizational capacity building is an investment in the effectiveness and future sustainability of a nonprofit or camp or NGO, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's really about, like you said, Alyssa, like how do you make sure that you're here for years to come? How do you make it more sustainable? How do you make something that is here to last? And in part one, which oftentimes everybody wants to focus on fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. But when I do consulting, I often say, let's look behind the scenes first. Let's see what structures you have in place. Let's see... Um, you know, how you're really operating, because all of that, if you have it done well, will lead to successful fundraising. So I'm going to spend the first um, little 20 or 25 minutes uh, talking about some iterations for what you need to think about with behind the scenes. And again, this could be applicable to startups, and it can be applicable to well-established organizations, because we've been doing this for over 15 years, and all these things that I'm about to talk about are still consistent conversations with our, within our organization about how we can improve them. So the first thing I want to share about is the board development. Um, when we started Mainsprings, I'm the founder, and so when I started, I had four board members and they were fantastic individuals, good supporters. They believed in me primarily, um, not necessarily our mission, which I'll get to in a minute, but they believed in me. They wanted to support me. And, you know, we started very, very small. But since those individuals believed in me, they were oftentimes a yes board. They were just like, okay, well, what, what do we need to do? Do we just need to sign off here? And there wasn't a lot of board ownership. And it's important to remember that within any organization or NGO, the board of directors is the owner of that entity. You know, they are the ones ultimately responsible. It's not myself, at least in the U.S. context and many other countries as well. It's not the executive director, CEO, or staff that owns that organization. It's the board of directors. And so having a really strong board um, is, you know, paramount to a successful organization. And also... The caveat to that is all boards of directors of nonprofit organizations are volunteers. So, you know, many times you get what you pay for. And um, so it's really important to kind of keep that paradox in mind about 
they are the owners of the organization, but they're also volunteers. And so we need to have them heavily involved, but we also need to, you know, make sure that um, we're respecting their time and the, the commitment that they're making to um, helping to run this organization. So when we started, like I said, we had four board members. Um, we grew over the next 10 years up to 11, um, grew down to nine members. And then, you know, about three years ago, we started focusing on really developing a stronger, more national board. Uh, so it, Main Springs is registered both in the U.S. as a nonprofit organization and in Tanzania as an NGO, non-governmental organization. And so we really wanted to focus on the U.S. board and how we can make it more diverse, especially geographically. We're still working on the other types of diversity that you could have of racial diversity, ethnicity, um, but we've, we have geography and professions covered. Um, but we really just took a look at what is the makeup of our current board? What do we want it to look like? Um, how many board members are there? Um, and do we have the bylaws that really guide our board? So, and we'll go into bylaws in a minute. But to give you all just a little bit of a, a history of how we transformed, you know, like I said, we had this very small board that wasn't really a working board. It wasn't functioning that well. Um, fantastic people, fantastic supporters. Some of them are still on um, our board today, and they've transitioned quite well into our, our new board structure. But we said, you know, we really want to grow this board and want to have a national board all across the U.S. But the type of people, since they are volunteers, the type of people we want involved probably will not travel for a board meeting once a quarter for a smaller nonprofit. And so what we created was an idea that we will have three virtual board meetings, uh, just one hour long per year, with the requirement that all board members attend in person a two day board retreat once a year. On top of that, we said, you know, we've never really had a great functioning committee except for our finance committee because we've always been devoted to making sure that we you know, keep our finances above board, very transparent. So we had a great finance committee, but not much else was being done. So we said on top of that once a year um, requirement for all board members to attend in person, wherever the board retreat is, we want every board member to be on at least one committee. And that committee will carry the work of the board throughout the year and then report back in our quarterly, just quick board updates. So that's really kind of how we've developed as an organization, but I'm, you know, working and I was telling Aaron right before this call, like I have helped coordinate board development workshops that are literally two and three days long. So we could spend a long time on this. I spent longer on it this morning um, and we're going to shorten it for the sake of conversation. Um, but it's very important to really focus on your board, focus on the health of your board. They ultimately are going to be the ones if you have a great functioning board to help you get more funding, help you get more connections, help you get just um, better contacts and, and knowledge about what you're doing. It's very important and we are going to create next week a full uh, Google Drive that'll be on the ERC Google Drive um, folder with supporting documents. So we have things like our board contract that we'll share um, basically, all of the different stuff that we're going to talk about today, we will have examples of, and I give you all full permission to copy, paste, steal, use, use them however you wish. So I will, you know, share some of that information so that you all can read through our actual documents. Um, but one thing I highly recommend is if you are at a place where you're working on growing your board, and I know some organizations just have kind of the founders and just a couple board members, um, and so need to just grow it bigger. But if you're at a place where you can grow your board to say six, eight, 10 members, um, it's a very, very good idea to have somebody and try to find somebody who would be a good board development person. So currently we've reached a point as an organization where we have a board development committee um, and actually have a committee that for the first, I'd say 12 years or so of us that was always my responsibility finding new board members. Now we have a committee who really steers that and helps me identify new board members on, on our behalf. Another really important uh, thing that will be asked of by certain foundations, and we'll get to grant writing a little bit later, um, but it's also a very good 
guiding principle for your organization is having very clear bylaws. Um, so I've outlined a few things here. These are not exhaustive. And again, I will share our bylaws so you all can copy, paste, and use them however you wish. But a few things that I think are the most important, especially when it involves a board, um, are very clearly defined officers. At the very least, you need a chair, vice chair or chair elect, which is what we have, secretary and treasurer. Um, it's also very important to define how big your board can be. When we first started, I think it was 10 or 15 members that were allowed by our bylaws. And when we decided to expand our board, we actually upped them to 25 so that we had plenty of room to grow. And so it's important to define board size and also define terms and term limits. So terms are, as you can imagine with a president, how long a person serves in that office. So our board terms are, typical, are, are three years and our officer terms, which are separate from board member terms, are two years apiece. The good thing about um, doing shorter officer terms is in the beginning, we had very devoted people, like I said, who were passionate about our mission, willing to support me. Um, we had sometimes a board chair serving as board chair for six, seven, eight years. And that is a big ask for most people. When you can clearly define your officer term limits, your board term limits, your board terms, that is a much easier ask to then go out and say, hey, will you be my next board chair? All you have to commit to is two years, then you can go back to being a regular board member if you want. And that's an incredibly important thing to think about of just really having that, that consistent um, flow and turnover. And it also, I've noticed over the past few years, really helps to give you new ideas, new energy. Um, and just even, even if the same people are on the board, you're switching out the leadership which is incredibly important. Um, we as an organization decided since we are smaller not to do term limits. Uh, so term limits are basically like here in the US, a president can only serve two terms. Some nonprofit boards have that same, same rule, um, whether it's two terms, three terms, four terms. Um, but with us, we decided that if we have a really good board member who is active, um, we want them to stay on board and we don't want them to leave. However, we want to have, you know, board terms clearly defined so that if somebody either themselves wants to come off or you want them to come off, there's just a natural time where you can have that conversation. And it makes it a much easier transition than just a willy nilly. Um, we really don't want you on this board anymore versus, hey, your term is up. And I realize like you've been super busy these past few years. We've grown in this way. Maybe it's time you you know, step off the board and support us in other ways. So that just really helps to kind of ease the, the transition into boards. Um, the other thing that I always stress with nonprofits is really make sure your board understands their reach. Make sure they understand their boundaries. Make sure they understand that they are not involved in day-to-day -day operations or staff management or any, any programmatic, you know, day-to-day -day decisions. They are very strategic high level thinkers and should be focused on fundraising strategy and helping you get to your goals and defining those goals. So very quickly, um, this is our Mainspring's current board structure. So we have a board chair, um, chair elect, secretary and treasurer. So again, all of those people are officers for two years during a three year board stint. And then all of the other board members fall into one of the standing committees. So we have a finance committee that is pretty obvious, board development. We have three different fundraising committees um, in California, Oklahoma, and New York. Um, we have a programs committee, which is really responsible for helping with our monitoring and evaluation and trying to help show the success of our programs. And then we have a sustainability committee um, helping to monitor the sustainability of our organization and try to put business plans in place behind some of our income generating programs that we have, which I will get into at the very end. So that is our, our board structure. And we do also have the capability to ad hoc committees. Uh, when COVID hit, we created a communications committee so that, you know, anything that we were sending out around COVID was sensitive and, you know, responsive to the various communities that we interact with. Um, 
and we've had also a strategic planning committees that every three years, three or four years, we do a new strategic plan. And so we have a steering committee that really helps to uh, steer that strategic plan. So another, well, I guess this is a small group. So any questions on board development before I move on? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I yes. think I do. Um, <clears throat> so just a question about like once you've established a good board, then like for the ongoing like onboarding of board members, is that does that become a decision of the board or is, is it someone in particular? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's a great question. So we primarily use our board development committee to make the selections, but per US law, um, the board does have to officially approve and we have to have it in our minutes to add a new board member. So sometimes that's done just by an e-vote via email uh, because we can, we can do that of saying, hey, this is the person that the board development committee is recommending. Um, do you all approve? We get enough yeses, and then myself and either our board chair or the head of the board development committee, whatever's easiest, um, do an onboarding process with that new board member. Yeah, and it's, it's also important is, you know, we stayed stagnant as an organization, very stagnant for a while with our board. Um, we'd have one person, you know, come in every three years, one or two, uh, one or two leave every two, three years. Um, but now we've really become much more focused on the need to both roll in people and roll out people from the board. And the roll out is often very, very difficult um, and not often considered enough because, you know, you need a really good functioning board. And there's certain people that were great when we were a smaller organization, um, but maybe can't really get their heads around who we are now. And so we've had to have what I had feared would be difficult conversations, but actually for the most part, um, all those individuals that we've asked to step off the board and there's only been a, a few, um, but you know, they've taken it well because it's the end of the term. It was a defined term and just, we, yeah, have a conversation about why that change is necessary. So oftentimes in the development world, and this is what I talked a little bit about this thing, saying no can seem like a very scary thing, whether you're saying no to money, no to a willing board member, um, no to anything, just because we need the money, we need support, we need as many people involved in our missions as possible. Um, but if it's not somebody who's going to really help you move forward, then it probably is not for your, in your best interest to keep them on. So, so yeah. Brandy, um, when, Oh, Alyssa, did you have another question? Oh, no, it's okay. I, I mean, I guess it's, maybe I will ask it just um, because both my parents ha have been involved in not-for-profits in different areas, Rotary and like um, community schools. And so I've sort of had the, yeah, the exposure to observe some things that can happen within boards, which is quite scary for me. Um, one example is when, basically one of the boards um, kind of formed two <laughs> different parties and um, were of a similar size group and, and so it became quite a battle. Um, so my question really is, like, do you think that having the larger board of, like, tw you've expanded to 25, do you think that decreases the chance of that kind of thing happening or is there a, a number of, have you had experience of something like that happening? <laughs> Um, we have not had experience of that happening. I have, I have heard about that when consulting with some other nonprofits. And I've also heard of the biggest nightmare you can possibly imagine. And I've heard of it at least a dozen times is when a foundation says we want one of our staff members or we mandate one of our staff members to be on your board of directors. That often means they have their own, <laughs> their own mission, their own prerogatives, everything in mind, because that's what they are hired to do. So in those cases, those people are not real board members. They are just representatives of the foundation to look over your shoulder and often, oftentimes cause, um, yeah, a lot of drama. 
we'll say. <laughs> so I've, I've helped some organizations through that drama um, and I've seen and heard about kind of the splits, but you know, primarily for us, the reason we grew the board. So we are allowed seven or five. We currently have 17 board members and are adding two more this year. Um, and I think a, I will tell you up front, it's a lot to manage. You're dealing with a lot of people, a lot of requests. And I constantly remind myself when I get text messages late at night or early morning or emails, like these are your bosses. These are your biggest supporters. These are your biggest advocates. You have to put up with it. And, you know, having eight or nine versus 17 to 20, that's, you know, a lot more to, to handle, handle and manage. However, it allows you to accomplish a lot more. And we wanted it really so that we could grow geographically um, here in the U.S. from a fundraising standpoint and at the same time have a lot more expertise because we do work in healthcare and education and restoration and female empowerment. So we identified a lot of different professional gaps that we had and wanted to fill those so that we could have representatives for each parts of our mission. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chris. I'll go on. So many questions, boards. I think this is about fundraising, so I'll let you go on. Thank you. <laughs> well, we can talk about boards all day long, but maybe another time. <laughs> um, and I will share my email at the end so you all can reach out to me. But so branding is also a very critical point. So once you have a board, or even if you don't, you yourself can focus on branding, but I would highly encourage you to involve as many people in the process as possible. And some of you may have this under wraps and this may be redundant, um, but at the very least from a branding standpoint, you want to you know, have your vision, have that lofty dream of where am I going? If my organization is successful, what does the world around my organization look like? And that's really your vision. From, from there, once you define that, um, you have to define your mission, which is how are you going to get there? You know, what's, what are the steps in kind of an inadvertent way to, to help you get to your vision? And it's also, in my opinion, good to really establish core values. Um, all of these things are very important. If, you know, you're a small nonprofit, small camp, and you only have a couple people and you both know how to talk about your mission and what you want to do, you know, without thinking, then this may not be as important, but as you grow, you know, as you have like us 17 board members, we have over a hundred staff members in Tanzania. Um, you know, it's really important early on to make sure that everybody on your team, whether that's a volunteer or a camper or board member, staff member, a beneficiary of your work, whoever it is, understands who you are, what you stand for and what you stand against as well. Um, because that's, that's really kind of important. Once you have that, um, it's important to create a consistent brand look, you know, have a logo, have a website, um, but also things like what are the colors you use? What are the exact colors you use? What fonts do you use? And make sure that everybody within your organization is aware of, of those types of branding things so that your look can be consistent. Oftentimes when you think about branding, you think of the Nike swishes or Adidas or Amazon logos or whatever these big companies brands are. Um, but it's just as important in, non in the nonprofit world for your supporters when they see an email come into their inbox to recognize immediately, oh, that's from Mainsprings. That's their look, that's their color, that's, you know, that's their vibe. And so spending a bit of time focusing on that, we with our, um, our own organization used to be called JBFC, the Janitor Bachelor Foundation for Children. It was named after my grandmother who originally took me to Tanzania and it was not until 2017 that we actually rebranded. And one of our new board members at the time had an advertising agency that did rebranding for big companies. And so we asked him to take this on and we said, we want a new name. JBFC is too hard to remember. Our website sucks, yada, yada, yada. So he really helped walk through um, everything from interviews of board members, staff and past volunteers and really worked with our staff on creating a new look, a new vision, new website, 
which funny enough this year we're going through again not a full rebrand but a full update of websites and all of that fun stuff so as i said in the beginning all of this stuff whether you're just getting started or whether you're well established it's all stuff you have to constantly kind of come back to and have conversations about just to make sure you're up to speed so Chris, that's our brand promise which is margarita oh. Okay. Um, she's curious to know if each person, going back to your um, board section, if each person on the board has special work to do, and I think you mentioned this, that yes, they do, um, because you're looking for each person to participate in a committee, um, at yes. least one committee. So that would be sort of their special work, and then they might give um, other um, ad hoc input. Is that correct. right? That is correct. Great. Yeah, so everybody at the very basic level has to at least join the board retreat and board call and be on a committee that makes sense for where they come from, um, whether that's, you know, profession or stuff like that. So, um, and beyond that, we do ask every board member to give financially to our organization, um, but we do not have a giving minimum. We say, even if you can only give one U.S. dollar, all we want to be able to say, because there are certain foundations that want to know, does your board support you? And we just want to be able to say, yes, annually, 100% of our board members support this organization. And that's, that's foundations I've seen in, in Europe and America primarily, but I would imagine that's foundations around the world that want to make sure your board is, is involved. So we do have a financial requirement, even if it is $1. <laughs> All right. Um, defining roles. So, you know, really working on your staff. And again, I know there's camps of various sizes, but uh, some people are one man camps and some people are multi person, multi staff camps. Um, but regardless of your size, it's really important to define the roles within your organization, within your camp. Um, it just helps to alleviate headaches and it also makes sure that you all are not dropping any balls. So it's perfectly fine for somebody to wear all of these hats. But if you do have more than, you know, one person, I would highly recommend um, having very clearly written job descriptions or at least expectations for each other. Um, it's especially true if you're a close group of friends because we've seen time and time again where organizations are started with an incredible passion and purpose and very close friends. And then the finger pointing starts when things aren't going well. And, you know, with clearly defined roles, that really helps to circumvent those types of issues. Um, but regardless, whether you're friends, whether you're just coworkers, um, really, as I've outlined here, make sure that you have somebody covering these different pieces of your operation and that it's, it's well understood who is doing what. Another important thing, and this will be, I will share our full succession plan in the G drive um, early next week, but it's important for all organizations for their sustainability to consider succession planning. Um, you know, we talk about our former board chair who helped create our succession plan with Mainsprings and it was, you know, 13 years in the making before we ever had one. So if you don't have one, do not worry. Um, but she said, you know, I always like to talk about the beer truck incident. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, what if one day you get hit by a beer truck and you're no longer here? And so we really focused on creating a strategy that helps and a document that helps to guide our board. If I win the lottery and decide to, you know, sail the oceans blue or um, whether something happens, um, organizations, especially small ones like all of ours, you know, really need to, think about the long-term long success of those organizations and making sure that it's not tied to just one person. And if it is tied to just one person, which is the case for us, because we don't really have a clear number two as far as who would take over for CEO um, yet. That's something we're still working on. But does your board know what they're going to be looking for? And do, do they know how to make operations happen in the meantime so that your organization doesn't flounder and the incredible work that you all are doing can continue. So having a guiding document that all of your board members, at least the committee your board knows, um, how to operate the organization in your absence, that's incredibly important. Um, another 
often overlooked thing uh, behind the scenes is staff development. Um, we have a heavy focus on staff development, providing educational opportunities, fun parties, um, different, you know, trips and professional development opportunities. So we do it both to increase the knowledge of our staff in various areas, but also to really improve their motivation because ultimately we want to keep a staff. If we like somebody, we want to keep them around, but we know in the nonprofit sector that can be somewhat tricky because, you know, I know all of us are in this work to make millions and millions of dollars, but sadly it doesn't come true. Um, so it's important to find other ways to motivate your staff while also um, really focusing on their own professional development and showing them that you care about, about their development. Our big thing is a behind the scenes um, thing that many people don't see, but when you do get into foundation support and grant writing, this becomes a very big thing. Um, many nonprofits that I've consulted with fo focus more on an approach of this is how much money we have, what can we do with it? And I always encourage people to go from that, you know, mindset to, you know, are you living month by month, quarter by quarter, annually further? But shifting from that this is what we have, let's see what we can do with it, to this is what we want to do as an organization, and this is how much it's going to cost. And being very realistic about your ideal budget, and then from there, and we'll go into a bit of, this will tie back into the fundraising a bit later, but ideally, you know, what are your operations? If your ideal organization for the next one, two, or three years, um, what, what does that look like? I encourage people to separate capital needs from operational needs. So the capital are the one-time investments that you want to, you know, put into your, your camp to make it better, whether that's a building, a vehicle, a tractor, what, whatever it may be, versus the operating are the staff, the program fees, all the different day-to-day -day operations that you are required to um, cover. So I always encourage people to think at least at least to budget year by year. Um, but preferably if you can give yourself a one to, or two to three year budget and try to think about a multi-year budget, that just really helps you with your fundraising because fundraising is a long game. It is not a quick, um, you know, here's $10,000 because you need $10,000. It typically requires a lot of legwork before that. So the more you can budget ahead and know your ideal number, know your, your ask, um, the better off you're going to be. Because also with that kind of initial thinking, I've seen many organizations when I ask, what do you need? Flounder with that question. And by all means, if you ever get the chance to answer the question, what do you need? Definitely make sure you have a solid answer that you can back up with a budget immediately because that will impress people. Um, the other thing with budgeting is to consider how your board is involved. Um, here in the U.S., by law, our board has to approve the budget, so they're heavily involved in the budgeting process. But regardless, I still encourage every nonprofit board to be involved in the budgeting process because it, um, they can help you set the goals, make sure they're realistic ones, but then also should be the ones to help you get there. Yes, it's going to take a lot of staff time, but the board should be heavily involved in uh, making sure you get there. Um, just, just to let you know, two quick Leon, things that's the time mark is, you requested. Um, and Margarita okay. has a question that I, I think, think I have. can answer and you can feel, feel free to fill that in in the chat later. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so then two quick things on the board is it's okay also to, especially we've had to do this since COVID because there's so much unknown about the economy around the world, about what programs we're going to be able to operate safely. So we've had a best case scenario budget and a worst case scenario budget of this is ideally what we'd like to do if things are safe, if we have the money, if, you know, all the things come into fruit, come into play, and this is our minimum operating budget and this is what we need to do. And then the other thing is always, no matter what, try to, and we did not do a good job the first 10 years as an organization, but try to focus on a reserve fund or a savings fund early on so that you can start saving for a rainy day because 
they will come, as we've seen with COVID and many other things. Very quickly, and you all can see this in the slideshow later, but um, make sure that you are accounting uh, for the money that you're spending appropriately, uh, both per laws of your country, but also for um, just good stewardship for your donors. Um, strategic planning is another thing that um, as you continue to move on, that's something that is really typically kind of a three-year um, guide for both your board and staff. To say, what are the high-level things that you want to improve on and put very specific measurable um, actions for each of those years with that strategic plan. And I will share a past one on the G Drive with you all so you can see what that looks like. Um, but I highly encourage you all to focus on strategic planning. And I also always encourage people to think about a communications plan. Um, and this is specifically for your supporters. Uh, but think about it in a yearly um, kind of a calendar year of plan out your entire year. How are you going to communicate with all of your supporters? And how are you going to communicate with your large supporters? And how are you going to communicate with your beneficiaries? Um, but having a strong communication plan is very important, knowing when you're going to send out emails, knowing when you're going to send out newsletters, um, when you're going to do fundraisers. Um, all of that stuff is, is very important. And I'll share, once again, all of this on the G Drive. And finally, for part one, trying to wrap up quickly, Aaron. <laughs> um, but also, the ERC is doing a great job with helping us with monitoring and evaluation, all of us. Um, so that's something because it's incredibly important to, you know, be able to quantify um, the success of your mission and what you're doing and be able to use that to tell a really impactful and, and compelling story. It's also important, um, especially here in the U.S., but many other uh, countries around the world to consider liability and how you can protect your assets, um, your staff members, your beneficiaries, and your board members um, from possible litigation and you know, somebody gets, has their leg broken by a tractor by accident. Um, in some cases that could sink an organization. So that's something really to always keep in the back of your mind as a leader of an organization is liability. And then also just make sure you stay true to yourself. Any questions on part one? No. All right, jumping into part two. Um, so all of this is kind of the fundraising. Um, anytime I'm working with our own organization or others, I always like to start at a deep, in a deep dive of where your money comes from now. Because this is, this is honestly what you know. This is the for sure stuff of you can say, I know I get X, Y, and Z from these places. Um, some things to consider are, is your, are your donations or support for your organization or camp institutional support? Or are they private donors, individuals, or family foundations? Um, and in my opinion, and us as an organization really started with private donors. Only in the past few years have we gotten into more institutional supporters and foundations. Uh, because private donors, you work on building a relationship with. And it's important to build a relationship with foundations as well. But it's much easier to befriend and talk to and have some leniency from private individuals and smaller donors than it is, you know, a foundation who has their own mandates and their own reporting requirements and just various constrictions that you're going to have to follow. And if you're not set up to follow those, you could harm that relationship for the long term versus, you know, working out some of the things that we talked about in part one and focusing more on, on private donors early on. But that's just my two cents. Some people prefer more of a balance and some people prefer just a few institutional supporters uh, support them as well. And I know several organizations that do very well with that. Um, also, when looking at where your money comes from, look at where it comes from. What is your average donation? Um, are you dealing with large donors? What we classify a large donor as is 5,000 US dollars um, or more, or are you dealing with smaller donors? And that will really help to inform the strategy that you want to have and help you target, you know, do I need to just reinvest in the relationships that I have with my current large supporters and help to grow that? Or do I need to cast a wider net and try to find, you know, a lot more $20 per year donors? And both strategies have proven to be effective for different nonprofits. It's just 
a matter of, you know, starting at where your money comes from now and building off of what you already have success with. Um, the other thing that is very important to think about is your donor retention. Um, and this is something that's typically tracked, you know, annually after you've been in operation for a few years. But the average retention rate for donors um, of nonprofits in the U.S. is anywhere from 40 to 45 percent. If you can improve upon that, um, you know, you're going to have much more success. It's much easier to keep a donor than it is to find a new one. So what donor retention really is, is um, if you have, let's say in 2019, 100 donors that donated to your organization, if you only have a 40% retention rate, only 40% of those donors are going to donate a second year. So finding ways, and we'll talk about different ways to retain donors, is incredibly important. Just again, I will reiterate that new donors are hard to find. Current donors are easier to motivate and keep, yeah, keep on board. So once you know where your money comes from, I always like to start with a fundraising plan. Um, I typically just do it in Excel and list, okay, these are our loyal supporters. This is the regular donors that I know how much I'm going to get from, or at least a range of what I will get from them. And map that out and have Excel add that up for me and say, okay, here's the foundations I know about. Here's the supporters. And then I compare that to our annual budget and say, okay, where's our gap and how are we going to make up for that? Um, typically, we've made up for that as a nonprofit with in-person fundraising events, whether they're ticketed or free with suggested donations. Um, you know, we've typically been able to fill our gap from our regular loyal supporters and those those can range in gifts anywhere from five dollars to several thousand dollars um but we just know that they're going to be consistent and the rest of it we i'm sorry cat <laughs> um the rest of it we've typically made up for in in-person fundraisers but obviously the last year and a half we've had to um yeah be more creative because we haven't been able to gather in person thanks to COVID 19. Um, so here's just some other things. Is it possible for you to meet people in person? I always, you know, encourage first and foremost in-person meetings. If that's not possible, um, you know, how can you really create a, a network and, and network with people, um, just to start sharing your mission? Um, board are an incredible way, as I said early on, they should be heavily involved in the fundraising process, the creation of a fundraising plan, and they should um, be yeah, actively involved in helping you find new contacts, new leads. If they have ends at foundations, which we'll talk about in a little bit, they should be helping to make introductions. And also when it's, it's feasible in different countries, they should be helping to host cocktail parties or luncheons or you know, doing whatever they can to help you um, meet your fundraising goals. Any questions so far? I'm trying to go somewhat quickly through this so that we can have more individualized questions and, and brainstorming. Um, so very quickly, and again, you can read through this, but I always say find any and all ways to accept donations. Make it as easy as possible. Um, we've had people donate stocks here in the US and in Europe. Um, you know, we accept cash check, credit card stocks, wire transfers, social media donations. The more ways that you can accept donations and make it easy for people to give you their money, the better. And also, depending on the country, um, make sure that you're registered in a way so that your donors in that country can get the biggest tax credit possible, because that's, in many cases, a, a big incentive for giving. And once you get donations, this is where a lot of nonprofits um, fall short. Aaron, was there something? Okay. Um, this is where a lot of nonprofits I've seen fall short is really tracking donations and following up with donations. So making sure, you know, when we started, we just used an Excel sheet and we had the date of donation, who it was from, their address, and the amount. Um, and made sure that we also had a note of, of when they were followed up with. 
now we use an actual database, a donor database that helps to track all of this information, helps to send out automatic emails if they donate online. It's gotten much easier in that sense, but it does cost a bit more money. Um, but it's very important just to make sure that however you can do it, you're tracking donations, you know exactly when somebody gave, um, how much they gave, what it was for, and also the typical rule of thumb that at least we have is there's a 48 hour response rule of if somebody donates, somebody within our organization needs to respond, whether that's an automatic response, if it's online or via mail, if they've sent in a check, but within two business days, we wanna make sure that we have acknowledged that person and thank them for the don donation and sent them a receipt. Um, so it's incredibly important to be timely and, and thankful. And also when tracking your donations, that's a really good way to get to know your donors. Um, I say fundraising is a lot like adult babysitting because you get, you need to get to know and know how to take care of all of your supporters. And, you know, we are to the point now where we've developed um, a system where we, we try to track as many people's uh, kids' names, dogs' names, what they're interested in, what makes them give, what got them involved in the organization, when did they go to Tanzania if they did go to Tanzania. And the more information like that you can have because as you grow that's going to be hard to remember you know if you have 10 to 20 donors right now that's pretty easy to keep track of and i used to keep track of a lot of that in my mind um, but being able to really put all of that down and, and grow that you're not going to be able to do that forever and it also allows other staff members to you know jump in and be able to help as well so really tracking as much information you can about donors and what they give to is, is great. The other thing, so I've mentioned the 48 hour rule that we have of if we receive a check or donation within two business days, we try to you know, make sure they get an acknowledgement. Um, but we also count the number of touches we have for each of our supporters per year. So the standard rule that I have heard and follow is to have at least seven touches for each one of your supporters throughout a calendar year. So they can be anything from personal emails or a phone call or Zoom call. They can be a handwritten note. You know, if you send a, an official don donation acknowledgement and then send a handwritten note afterwards, that counts as a, a touch. Newsletters count as a touch, but they probably shouldn't count for more than three or four. And actually, if you have a really well-written donation ask, um, that's, that's also a, a great touch because it's a, a personalized ask. Um, we also do little things like personal <clears throat> messages and videos from our kids or staff in Tanzania if somebody supported a special project, or sometimes we'll put a plaque on a building if they built it. So those types of donor gifts and special acknowledgements uh, for the larger supporters are also important. And, you know, we always like to think about our supporters in kind of two main groups of the majority of our fantastic supporters and then the the top level kind of large, larger supporters. And those people typically do have more than seven touches because you really want to focus on the relationship with them. Um, so another thing that touches do not count for, social media posts. So it doesn't matter how much your supporter loves your social media page. Um, I would encourage you not to consider that a touch just because that has become so um, run of the mill every day, you know, just, normal nonprofit stuff these days that that shouldn't count as a touch. Um, but if you can see them, call them, thank them, acknowledge them, any of that counts as a touch and make sure in your communication plan that we talked about earlier, this is addressed for all of your supporters. And while I said social media doesn't necessarily count as a touch, it is a fantastic tool for helping to get um, supporters more familiar with your mission, keep up to date with what's going on, it's much more real time. It also is a great way to grow, you know, the number of people who know about your work. Um, so, you know, try to identify the types of supporters that you have, what social media platforms they follow. Historically, we had only Facebook and have recently jumped to Instagram because we're, we're quite behind that ball. I'm not a great social media person, but, um, you know, we've switched. So now we have both Facebook and Instagram and doing Facebook less and less um, because we've just seen a lot more following, following on Instagram. But it's important to be consistent, um, especially on Instagram. We've learned it's important to post at least twice a day. Three times is even better. Um, 
it's also great to know that you can schedule your post so that you can literally sit down one time a week and schedule your post for both Facebook and Instagram all at the same time just to be broadcast out throughout the week whenever you uh, choose it to go out. And I also, and we spent a little bit of time talking about this this morning, you want to make sure that your posts are relatable to your audience. You know, you need to make sure you know your audience. And the more positive stories, fun faces, um, just feel good stories you can put out there, the better. Um, I always say that people like to jump on a floating ship, not a sinking one. And so the more that you can be positive about your mission and the opportunities that you're providing for the environment or for people in your community or whatever the case may be, that is um, much more effective and gets much, a much better response than the gloom and doom that we see all over the, the news these days. You know, I think in the late 90s, early 2000s, at least here in the US, there was um, a lot of very sad nonprofit commercials, the Sarah McLaughlin just rip your heart out because they want to try to make you give because you feel guilty. Um, I think with all of the news coverage and media coverage that we have and how negative our world has become, especially recently, people are much more likely to follow and want to follow the positive fun stories. So even though we're all dealing with very serious issues and we all have our stresses and major issues that are going on, keeping it positive is uh, the way to go. Um, and then finally, a great way is try to engage your audience on social media. Um, ask for favorite memories. If somebody has been to a camp, ask them to post pictures, have fun polls, have different quizzes. Um, the more you can do like that to engage people, that'll just increase the number of views that people have for your page and ultimately increase the number of people, um, yeah, following you. And again, all of this is really important to tie into a calendar. So know when you're going to reach out and to who. Um, and it's very important to not always be asking for money. Especially, so I've talked about the touches. My general rule of thumb is I like to talk to people at least two to three times before I ask them for money again. And if they bring up on, you know, the first time, hey, what do you need? then we can have that conversation, but I make sure it's not me who's brought it up. Um, because you want to, again, think about fundraising as a relationship. You know, you're entering into a relationship of sorts with your supporters. And so the more you can build that, the longer it's going to last, the better retention you're going to have, and the more you'll get out of people, honestly, because they're going to just feel more connected to you. Um, some other fundraising ideas, and again, all of this, every topic that we're discussing could be a full day seminar and talk, so I know I'm going quickly. Um, but we as an organization have had galas, luncheons. Um, you have mentioned Rotary Club. I put that in here. That's a great place to start because Rotary Club is very generous uh, philanthropically, and they're located all around the world and can partner with different Rotary Clubs to do quite massive things, and they have a great matching program. Um, also, I've mentioned, make sure your board is involved, have board events, and have them have cocktail parties or smaller dinners or whatever the case may be. And never underestimate the power of just a one-on-one -on -one lunch or breakfast or coffee, um, or just even a phone call. So all those are, are great ways to have in-person events. Um, I think I mentioned we've had both ticketed events, and we've had um, free events with suggested donations. Um, in the events that we've had, the free events, we've typically had somebody host it so that we as an organization are not out the money. Um, if we do have a ticketed event, then that's where we will create a budget, make sure that we, you know, cover the cost of that fundraiser with the ticket cost and other sponsorship cost. And finally, we also, um, just last year and this year, jumped into the virtual fundraiser, you know, realm because of COVID-19. I will say it is not my favorite thing to do, but one benefit that was actually very nice is we were able to connect with people um, from around the world uh, because we have supporters in Europe and the U.S., um, some in, you know, different parts of the world. And so it was actually a really great way this past April to be able to have a 45-minute program that was pre-recorded 
Um, it was definitely a clear ask for donations. And if you look on our YouTube channel, which I'll share later, you can see our virtual fundraising event. Um, and John Liu was actually uh, featured and he was one of our guests. So that was great to have him. Um, and only a couple more slides and we can open it up. But here's just a few grant writing techniques. Again, I am being redundant, but whether you're dealing with a foundation or a person, relationship is key. Um, if you can get a foot in the door, whether it's an introduction or just even a phone call to talk about the possibility of, you know, a relationship with that foundation, that'll get you much further than just a cold, cold call application. Always make sure when you're writing grants, and I know Aaron mentioned that Faye and Christina are willing to help with this process, so I don't need to go into too much detail, but always write with a reader in mind. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time. Make sure you double check your numbers and budget and you know them by heart because there typically are follow-up calls and they will ask you the numbers. And I have been caught up on a few times of, uh, I don't know, I'll have to get back to you. Uh, so make sure you know your numbers and you know exactly what you're asking for. And the other thing that I talked about this morning is I highly recommend with new foundations, if you're going after grants, starting with a smaller ask. Typically, when you look up foundations, they will give you a range of gifts that they give. And you can look at what they give to, and you can look at what types of things they support. Um, but in my experience, and this is not always the case, but most of the times, the organizations that are getting the most money from those foundations are organizations that have been in their portfolio for some time. So when asking for the first time from a foundation, always try to start on the lower side. Um, it's often, oftentimes called a get to know you grant. Um, and we talked to Jonathan, who's on the call a little earlier about this, but it's you know, just a chance for you to build a relationship with that foundation. Um, it's a chance for them to get to know you and you to get to know them. Because different foundations like different forms of communication they like different forms of reports. They have different requirements per their bylaws. So getting to know them at a smaller donation level is a much you know, less risky way of going about something um, and helps you also in the long term to build on that relationship and ultimately, hopefully, get more um, and just show them that you are successful in what you say you're going to do. And starting with a smaller project is easier than tackling a much bigger project. And it's better to be successful in a foundation's eyes um, on a small level than it is to fail on a much larger level. And then also make sure always with your grant writing include administrative costs. Uh, focus on your strengths. Um, you know, we have a work with several different smaller organizations in East Africa. And so many times they want to focus on their needs, their needs, their needs. Every foundation knows that nonprofits need money. They know exactly why you are calling them, why you're initiating this relationship. You don't need to tell them that you need money. What you need to show them and tell them about is why you're unique, why you're worth investing in, what is so special about you that sets you apart from the other gazillion people who are asking them for the same amount of money. Um, and so many people get in the weeds of, oh, we just need X, Y, and Z to do this. Focus on your story, focus on your strengths, and that will carry you much further. And then finally, be very consistent, especially when it comes to foundations with communication and reporting. Um, like I said in the beginning, they are much less forgiving than individual supporters are. So that's something always to keep in mind. And my last slide, um, which may or may not be relevant to this group, I'm not quite sure, but in Tanzania, we try to be as um, sustainable as possible. So we kind of blur the lines between a nonprofit and business in certain circumstances. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of camps because um, you know, we're producing food, we're providing educational experiences, possibly charging for camps. Um, so I wanted just to just give a few ways that we do that. Pictured here is our on-campus um, restaurant and lodge, which we have a farm to table menu from our permaculture farms. Um, we serve the larger community and the tourist community because we're very close to the Serengeti National Park. Um, and then we also have a bunch of volunteers that come. So we get income in country through this on-campus restaurant and lodge. We also charge, we 
on normal years, pre-COVID, have about 150 volunteers a year that we charge a volunteer fee um, to come and visit. So we actually make money off of our volunteer program. And that's incredibly important. And I think, Alyssa, you mentioned um, you just kind of covered your cost. I always encourage people like hosting campers, hosting volunteers is a lot of work. It's a whole lot of work and it also takes a lot more time and a lot more money than you think it ever will. Um, so trying to make sure that you're not, you know, running a deficit just because of your volunteer program or your camper program is incredibly important because, you know, that will take away from the operations of everything else you're doing. Uh, we also charge a modest school fee for some of the day students who can't afford it. We sell excess produce from and livestock from our farm. And I think that's about all we do as far as sustainability. So um, I just wanted to quickly mention that we do as an organization try to be a little bit business minded in certain, certain areas that we focus on. Margarita also wants to know what is the material you have in the roof on the pictures for your buildings here? Oh, that's um, a cane bamboo. It grows like weeds. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, it's a spreading bamboo that, yeah, just takes over everything. So we actually use it for a lot of building materials because it looks nice and it's free. Yeah. And finally, and we'll open it up for questions, but just make sure to be persistent in fundraising. It's not an easy game. You're gonna get far more no's than you are yeses. Um, in the grant world, the typical rule of thumb is that you'll get one successful grant for every 10 applications you submit. So don't be hard on yourself, make sure not to give up and just keep you know, pushing forward, seeing what works best, analyzing when that does work well, and yeah, move it forward. All right, well, once again, I talked a lot. <laughs> um, but since there's only a few camps on here, I guess we can open it up for more questions and conversation or brainstorming. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, there's so much in that presentation that I think um, is just the bread and butter of what starts to happen when you're running an organization. Um, and some of it happens all at the same time and some of it comes as you grow and as you learn um, and um, yeah, sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming, um, kind of like, what have I gotten myself into? Um, but I think when you see the work that each of the camps is doing around the world, um, the value in, in those activities is, is, is just absolutely shining through. And so the more camps um, and the, the teams within a particular camp project build their fluency, um, because I think of fundraising as kind of a type of language that you learn. Um, as you build your fluency in fundraising, um, it becomes easier and you're able to communicate um, that value and the importance of, of the work um, to a larger audience, which I think is really powerful for um, the ecological needs of our time and also for the people who are involved in those projects. Um, so thanks so much for sharing. Um, your points here. We have a couple of minutes. Um, yes. And I'd like to invite um, camps to talk a little bit about maybe um, where they are in their um, fundraising steps or kind of what's coming up for you. Um, so my suggestion in fundraising, I find it to be always a personal journey. Um, it's something that you determine your style, the way um, that you interact, um, the types of fundraising activities you want to take on, where you feel comfortable, um, places where you want to move into um, more of a, what's the word I'm looking for, um, a little outside of your comfort zone and really push yourself, and also to find ways to build that network around you so that it's not just your fundraising, but it becomes um, a web of interactions that are close to the work that you're doing and some that are further away. Um, so I'm curious um, if the camps might want to share a little bit about um, where is that comfort zone for you right now and, and, and wh where are the areas that you want to expand in the future?
And also while you're thinking about yeah, this question, um, I'm going to put a link to a feedback survey if you want to multitask um, while we're talking and fill that survey out. That would be really helpful for us as well. Yes. And also while you're thinking, um, a couple things I forgot. Um, when doing fundraisers and your fundraising plan, um, it's important with absolutely everything you do to have um, a dollar amount goal associated with each event or each activity or annual fund. Um, one thing I failed to mention is our biggest time of fundraising is the end of the year um, because, you know, close to two thirds of people like, in, at least in the U S like to donate in the last six weeks of the year. And so we have a very targeted approach at the end of the year. Um, but it's very important regardless to have a goal for everything you do and also make sure there's a specific ask to the donors, whether that's via letter or whether that's in person and you're speaking at an event, make sure there is a specific ask associated with a goal that you have in mind. Here we go. Back to Aaron's question. Hi, I'm happy to speak. Um, yeah, I, um, so we're, we're still in the very early stages of developing a fundraising strategy and plan and really early stages of a lot of things. Um, I mean, so far we've been supported with private donor um, for some of our, you know, startup costs and for a loan for the, the, the land that we're on. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is um, uh, particularly with having you here, Chris, and you speaking that you, your um, organisation has lots of different sort of objectives. So you're supporting women, you're doing regen ag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like we're very similar. Like we came in with a very holistic um, sort of vision or mission around, you know, what it's going to take to to <laughs> become more in line with what the earth needs, you know, and all of the, the beings on the earth. So it's so holistic and so broad. And I guess we're now honing in a little bit more, but we still have many different, like we're doing, you know, um, yeah, regenerative agroecology. And then we've got um, an interest in supporting women and also indigenous um, objectives and health and whatnot. So I'm just wondering, like, if you could speak to how do you navigate that when it's so broad? like in terms of finding an audience and fundraising? Well, mm. I would tie that back to your vision and mission. Um, because the, the broader, like our mission is to alleviate extreme poverty and uh, alleviate extreme rural poverty in Tanzania, East Africa. So it's mm. a very lofty goal. And then we go into a little bit more about how we do that um, through those, those four different areas that we work in. But you know, our driving mission and everything that we do needs to point back to that one driving force of mm -hmm. there is so much extreme poverty in rural Tanzania that that is what we're trying to tackle. Mm -hmm. And we have identified these four areas as the four main ways to help us address the, the holistic needs of the communities that we serve. Right. Um, so <laughs> I, I would definitely start the vision and mission and make that broad. If you're being holistic, make it broad enough to where you don't have that mission creep but specific enough that it still speaks about who you are. Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be make the world a better place because that's, yeah, we all want that <laughs> um, for sure. But it needs to be, you know, again, measurable and targeted. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> yes. right. Any other questions, thoughts? And again, we hope to keep this as an ongoing conversation between all of the different camps. Um, we had a large group this morning and um, have had some people fill out the survey. So I encourage you to do so because I'll be working with Faye and Christina to uh, yeah, figure out how we can move the needs of the different camps forward even more and more. Chris, I think it's really interesting that you have this perspective um, from doing some of the practices as well. A lot of um, our partners... The, import, the primary importance of the work that they are doing and they're committed to is outside. Um, so how do you balance that with all of these administrative needs and, and the, the fundraising time? Do you dedicate a specific amount of time to it? Um, do you just 
do what feels right um, for your for yourself. How has that evolved? Yeah, so I actually have a permaculture farm here in Oklahoma where we are based in the U.S. Um, so I lived in Tanzania full time for 10 years and moved back five and a half years ago uh, to really focus on all the stuff that we're talking about from organizational development and fundraising and expansion. Um, so it was an adjustment because I was on the ground in day-to-day -day operations to strictly oversight at the beginning. Um, but this past year during COVID, decided to move out of the city and start a permaculture farm. So, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, it was a challenge when I was in Tanzania because you want to be out doing things. You want to be out seeing people, hands on the ground. Um, same thing for me now with my own farm. Um, but it's incredibly important to constantly remind yourself because I will tell you none of the stuff that we've talked about is necessarily fun. If we compare it to planting trees and hosting campers and, uh, you know, doing earthworks or whatever it is your camp does, everything that we have just discussed over the past hour and a half is not going to be more fun than that. However, it's important to constantly remind yourself that that is what makes, that is the vehicle that drives the rest of everything that you do and what makes everything possible. So I just have to constantly remind myself, even if I don't want to do this board call or even if I don't want to do this report, it's for the greater purpose. And yes, that does mean allotting specific times for, for that, which sometimes I do well at and sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes I just want to go out and yeah play <laughs> well and certainly you know that out I think that that outdoor time really motivates the purpose of doing the fundraising and the um and the relationship yeah. building um so I think we have maybe time for one last comment um and I also wanted to mention or reinforce the fact that um, one of the ways that I think we can be helpful here as ecosystem restoration camps um, is that we can provide some of that capacity, even though we're far away. Um, if you want somebody to look over um, a week's worth of social media posts before you put them up, um, we've got staff members that can take a look at that for you. We can't run your whole social media program um, or your whole fundraising program but we can try to, you know, build out a couple of um, additional um, allies, even though we're far away, um, to help you move some of those pieces forward. Um, so I, I hope that that offer is clear from, from this conversation as well. Um, should we do one more question? Anybody have any? Thing or should um, otherwise we'll let um, Chris have the final word and um, and we'll send you the information by email um, with all of the slides and any other documents. Yep. Any final question? One, please. Hi, I'm Vince, working with Elisa. Uh, the question I have for both of you, I guess, is in terms of your fundraising, uh, Chris especially, do you find that there's particular groups uh, whether it's like corporations or particular types of funding organisations that um, are more beneficial to speak with? And has that changed since you were sort of a startup to where you are now? Um, it has definitely changed from startup to now. Um, mm -hmm. Because there, and we talked with Jonathan, who's on the call this morning, about the difference between the get to know you grants that I talked about and seed grants. Um, a lot of people are very interested in helping fledgling organizations get off the ground, uh, but that's typically a two, maybe three-year commitment. And they're, those types of foundations are really focused on that startup phase. Um, we went the private donation route um, in our startup phase, um, mm -hmm. and so started very small and, and humbly, but just continued to yeah, slowly grow from there. And I would say the landscape is always changing. Um, you know, this past year and a half, we've gotten more into some European foundations and supporters, and that's a whole new ball game for us. In America, people are shifting their priorities constantly, not, not just even because of COVID, but even before that. 
you know, I feel like every time we have a presidential election, I have to kind of slightly adjust our, our tactic uh, mm -hmm. with whatever happens. So all of the things that we've discussed today need to be on your radar all the time and you need to be constantly monitoring them. And if you are able to build those really good relationships with foundations and supporters and just friends and family, then you can kind of monitor those trends just based on your conversations, I found. You can kind of see what, what people are more interested in. You can see what foundations are giving to. Um, here in the US, we have a very hard time because we work in East Africa of convincing mm -hmm. corporations to give us any support. So I've, I've just totally stopped even asking corporations for support and just go after foundations or individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Europe, there are much, many more incentives for some European corporations and even European governments um, because we've gotten a couple of grants from different European governments to support, you know, work in sub-Saharan Africa. So it really depends on your location and what the incentives are in each country and what the restrictions are. Mm. Here in America, corporations are selfish. They only want to give to Americans. <laughs> mm. So. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Aaron, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that that makes perfect sense. So thank you so much, Chris, for this presentation. I do want to wrap up so that we stay um, mindful of people's schedules. Um, and I really appreciate that you were all able to join for the full call. Um, Margarita, if you want to um, catch up on anything that we missed we, and um, from, from your side or things that you want to share about your camp, I'm happy um, as always, to have a chat with you. And um, similarly, um, we'll be in conversation. Um, and you guys have Chris's email here. Um, he has kindly offered to follow up with uh, emails or another phone call if you want to get into a, a more detailed conversation on any of these pieces. So thank you all so much for joining. Yes. Well, and thank you for hosting, Aaron. It was great to see you all and talk to you all. Please be in touch. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Erin. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Margarita, Jonathan. Bye.